Hello, the Cinemascope here. I'm Joe Brown, and here I am with Andy Canny, a editor from uh, Australia originally, and he now lives in the States in LA. How are you doing, Andy? I'm great, thanks, Joe. Good to meet you. Yeah, so if people don't know Andy, Andy's directed, uh, sorry, Andy's edited a couple of my literally favourite films, um, especially a film called Upgrade, which is a sci fi film made in 2018, which I absolutely love. So, Andy, where are you talking to us from? Uh, I'm in LA at the moment and um, been here just uh, finishing up a couple of projects and um, yeah, just waiting to see what, what happens next. Yeah, but you're not, you're not, you're from Australia, right? So you grew up in Melbourne, you said? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, originally from Melbourne, Australia and I went to film school in Sydney back in 2000 and then spent uh, quite a few years living there and uh, most of the film work in Australia happens between Melbourne and Sydney, so I've spent a bit of time between those two places over the years, but I, I, now based in LA. Yeah, I actually lived in Melbourne myself for uh, for six months. Uh, I played cricket, so I actually played ah. a season of cricket over there uh, in okay. 20, 2015, yeah, so that's quite interesting. Yeah, um, yeah, no, it's, a, it's a great town. Yeah, it's amazing. Um, so did you always, so when you went into film school, did you want to go to edit, was it always editing, or was it always like, yeah, absolutely. I mean, look, I, when I'd actually already been uh, working as an editor for quite a while. When I went to film school, I'd been cutting commercials uh, in Melbourne, and that was sort of uh, my main thing back then. And, and honestly, just cutting anything that I could, whether it be like, you know, corporate films or uh, music videos or whatever I could do. But I really wanted to, you know, find myself working in feature films and um uh, and so going to film school was a chance to kind of reset and meet other people and focus more on the creative side of editing. So, um, so that was sort of really why I went there more so than necessarily learning anything technical, although we did kind of dive into a few different things. It was more about just focusing on the creative side and the creative process of working with directors. Mm -hmm. and, uh, in in features. Interesting. Interesting. Cause like when I've spoke to other editors, many of them have said to me that it wasn't actually editing they originally went to film school for. They kind of, they said, oh, we're going to be directors or we're going to be whatever. And then they suddenly found that editing was their, or their natural calling, so to speak. But you seems like you automatically kind of felt that, that you always wanted to go into it. Yeah, I, 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 straight after high school, I ended up doing a course in art and design. So I was sort of more interested in that side of things um graphic design or fine art and um but the course that i was doing had a broad overview and we did everything from sculpture to painting to photography um we also did a little bit of work with some video cameras you know that was like vhs cameras and um and editing uh on vhs and i actually really loved that part of it um and but certainly at the time when i was starting out i just wanted to be in, i knew i wanted to be involved in film and television production somehow, but I didn't know exactly. And I, I did do other things like sound recording and a little bit of camera work and um, some production assisting type stuff just to kind of get involved in any way I could. But, but I did always gravitate towards the post-production side. And uh, it was around that time that computers were getting um, more, becoming more part of the post-production world. And that gave me opportunities to teach myself the software and then get opportunities to work. Um, and, uh, and that's how it's sort of, you know, I, I loved the technology side. I love the, the creative side and mixing the two and, you know, uh, still, still doing it now. Mm. Yeah, that, that's interesting. So how hard do you think it is to learn the software? Is it, is it about just, com just getting into it, getting involved and really uh, developing your own skills at it, so to speak? It, would you say it's, difficult to learn or is it more of a sense of like you've got to put the hours in to get the rewards yeah I, I think that's um I think that's certainly true I, I guess if you love it like I do if you're passionate about it then you're not going to find it that difficult to mm. um you're not going to find it that difficult to to learn you know you're going to want to put in the time and the hours and I always found, found it exciting to to, yeah. to learn um, but it just depends how you learn some people pref might prefer to do a course or something like that I was always just happy to kind of dig in and play around and spend the time doing it and I'm still uh, finding on myself on projects software keeps changing you know a different job may have a different um, it might be using a different editing system and I've got to learn something new um, it's fun to be able to play around with visual effects and motion graphics as well. And so sometimes I'm having to teach myself 
different bits of software on a project and uh, I quite enjoy it. You know, I don't mind kind of doing that. And sometimes it's, you know, it's online tutorials or it's just kind of sitting down and playing or having a project that you need to achieve something uh, and then just trying to nut it out. And so uh, I think it's, it's helpful if you enjoy learning new software because it's, we work in an industry where that technology is constantly changing and evolving and it's helpful to feel like you're excited about kind of learning something new because that's going to happen anyway. So it's yeah. going to, yeah. But yeah, figuring out like which, you, which way you like to learn. Yeah. It sounds like you, like, as you just said, you are always, I suppose whenever you get a different movie or whenever you get a different piece of work, you're always learning new things and picking up different things that you're going to take on and so on and so forth. And it's always about, obviously developing your own skills but then learning from each 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 time you are on a film or on a tv sh tv show or when you edit you're always honing in on them skills as well yeah absolutely and every, you know that's one of the fun things even though in a way the job is kind of the same thing that i was doing you know 20 or 30 years ago yeah. using pictures and sound and putting them together in a coherent way to tell a story and hopefully um connect with people emotionally and whether that was a television commercial or a music video or a feature film now, um, you kind of on, on some basic level, it's the same idea, but uh, depends on what the subject matter is and you know, what kind of, whether it's a, a horror movie or a sci-fi or a comedy, uh, all of these things, you know, there's different things to learn and you learn things by watching different actors and how they approach uh, their performance. You learn by working with different directors and what's important to them and how they like to work and, how they tell stories and so I've been really lucky to work with some really talented people in that regard and uh, you know and I, I think that's one of the things that I like about editing is that you do get to kind of have this really great up close and personal view of watching people work whether they're actors or directors or producers and writers and, and get to see how their process um, how their process is and, and how they you know like to work and yeah it's 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 fun you know and same with like visual effects people and um composers and sound designers and you know constantly learning stuff about post on every on every job that i do mm, yeah definitely you have worked with some really great directors one in particular which we will we'll, we'll touch on in a bit um so i just want to have your personal opinion what is be what does being an editor mean to you what is if you could break it down into your own words, what is it specifically that you try to do when you're on a film or when you're editing? Yeah, I think uh, editing is really, it's, it's a number of things. I mean, first and foremost, I think it's, it's my job to be the first audience for the material when they're filming. So um, I'm looking to see, of course, if it makes sense, if, if uh, the director has um, gonna have options and choices, you know, if things are technically correct, um, that they're going to be able to achieve the things that they're wanting to achieve with their vision for the film, um, and that making sure all of that's on track. But probably the most important thing is that as the first audience, I wanna see that there's, a, there's the emotional response to the material uh, that is the intention. Um, and so I'm looking for that, you know, when I'm watching um, all of the dailies and figuring out uh, how we're going to put it together and it's you know the chances of me my first version of it being the final version in the film is pretty small because there's going to be once you see those scenes in context uh, in the final film then you, you of course you're going to change them um, and as as the sort of organic nature of making a movie um, sort of rolls out you know all of these things come into play and you're going to watch it with an audience and then you're going to feel their response and so all of that feeds into the fact that of course the first version and the last version you know, it changes yeah. a lot. Um, I, I guess otherwise I wouldn't have a job. So that kind of is a helpful <laughs> thing that yeah. that is what the way the process goes. But um, always remembering for me, trying to hang on to that, a memory of that first emotional response that I had to watching the material the first time, because mm -hmm. that's, that's your connection to the audience at the end. And those are the key things that you really want to make sure uh, are landing in the right way yeah. in the final version. And so trying to hang on to that and to try and feed that back to, to the director and to make sure that those things are integrated into the movie. So you're really almost foreseeing each, so each scene that you work on or each day that you get, you're almost putting yourself in the audience's like shoes almost, watching it in the cinema and seeing how's this gonna come across and how's it gonna make them, how's it gonna make that person feel, this person feel, and you've got to almost foresee it happening to then put it together almost. 
Yeah, absolutely. And then I think it's also um, part of my role to be critical of the material as well, you know, to kind of really try and examine every part of what um, they're achieving. And maybe people, you know, everyone's worked so hard on this sometimes for years leading up to that moment of actually filming it. And people have spent hours creating these particular uh, shots and, you know, hundreds of people have kind of worked on a particular moment. Uh, but it's important that still somebody is able to you know, remove themselves from all of that hard work and just look at that moment critically and sort of examine it and say, does this belong in the film? Is it actually doing what you want it to do? Even though that was the intention, yeah. is it actually delivering them on that? Or is it somehow working against this overall vision? So uh, I think it's trying to uh, be critical of every part of the filmmaking, but in a way that is respectful of the work that is there yeah. and also respectful of the director's intention because what I'm trying to do is make sure that the film is as great as possible and is delivering what they want. So it comes from a place of wanting things to be better. It's being critical of things um, in a way which isn't necessarily always pointing out the bad things. Sometimes it's actually looking at it and saying, no, this is great. You know, sometimes maybe they weren't as excited about something that they achieved on set and maybe a scene isn't working exactly like a director wants it to. But, you know, sometimes it's my job to kind of be there and be the audience and go, no, this is an exciting thing and I really enjoy this, watching this. And so, you know, don't, let's not dismiss it. Let's sort of, let's hang on to and keep this moment. And so uh, sometimes it's just there to be a sounding board for the director as well and to um, to give them, you know, another sort of creative person to to feedback and, and bounce things off yeah did you did you personally find that difficult at first to do them things or did you know always know that was going to come with the job to not as, as you said it's not to criticize it's to come from a place which is going to make the project better but were you, were you ever nervous or worried about uh, ever have a scenario where you're worried about doing that uh no, I don't think so. I mean, I always try and usually I'm meeting with directors before a project and uh, even, you know, back when I was cutting commercials, I mean, I feel like partly what you're doing is there to, you're there to have an opinion, you know, it's sort of not just about sort of pushing the buttons and putting things together. Um, part of my role is to actually have opinions and, and give voice to my own ideas and thoughts in order to try and achieve what the director wants. But it, and not all of those opinions are going to be right. You know, not all of those ideas are going to work, you know, but mm. it's about just keeping on trying to have lots of thoughts and ideas because then you're feeding into the creative process. And if that shifts things like even just a few percent, well, then I feel like I've done a, I've done a good job, you know, I've contributed something to the film. And um, so I think, yeah, one, it's about, um, I think if, especially if you work with someone before, obviously that gets easier because there's trust there and that they understand that, that these ideas and thoughts are coming from a place of wanting the movie to be as good as possible. But mm -hmm. I think it's also important to offer up solutions, you know, and not just mm -hmm. kind of kind of say, well, I don't know, this doesn't work, you know, but, but here's, here's what could work and maybe we'll still give you what you need. So I think yeah. that's also something that um, I feel like I've always been able to do is not just kind of be critical of something or talk about something not working or, you know, have, having reasons behind what you're doing and then also offering up solutions that, uh, and there's lots of different ways of, of offering those solutions in, in post-production and in editing. There's so many different ways you can put things together. Uh, so it's kind of constantly being able to have a new idea or if a director kind of comes to you and goes, look, I don't know about this. It's just, I don't, you know, this isn't working and, and then we can find ways to, to make it work how they, how they would like yeah. to. So. It, it definitely sounds like, it's the relationship between the director and the editor is so important for the final outcome of the, of the film. So you've almost got to build a rapport before, like, as you say, in, in build up to cr creating the film, you've got to not, you've got to get on, you've got to uh, see each other's vision and almost have the same one about where the film's going to go. And then also have that respect between each other to make decisions where uh, you might, as you said, you might be a bit critical of a certain uh, certain scene or you might be a bit critical of, of so on and so forth. So it does sound like it's very important to have the people skills to be able to work with a variety of people, especially as an editor. I think so. I think it's, it's as equally as important as anything that you might know technically is just, mm. you know, figuring out the best way to, to, to communicate with people. Uh, and that that's probably communicating with all the departments in, uh, in the film, uh, you know, whether it's the camera department, sound department, art department, mm. all of these other, um, you know, we come in contact with them all at various times during the shoot. 
um, but especially, yeah, the relationship with the director. And um, that's something that the sort of earlier I can get involved in the process, the better, because again, it's, um, it's kind of often easier to make suggestions about things that might be helpful before they actually start shooting, as mm -hmm. well as just kind of looking at things afterwards, you know, and if during the shoot, you can actually be kind of coming up with ideas and solutions for how they could modify or change things um, to help them uh, um, again, I, I feel like it's all just really about trying to help people and solve yeah. their problems. And if I can come up with some solutions that we can deal with in post, or that's something maybe they don't have to worry about now while they're shooting, or something while they're shooting, maybe they should quickly try and get this shot while they've got the resources and everyone available, yeah. uh, something that might be helpful um, that they could choose to use later. And so again, all of that I think goes towards, yeah, building up trust and and also trying to demonstrate that you understand their vision of what they're trying to achieve. Because, you know, again, usually with, with feature films, that's it's really working towards the vision of the director and trying to, um, uh, trying to serve that and trying to help them achieve what they need to. Um, and yeah, sometimes uh, it's been critical of things, but often, yeah, just trying to help them come up with solutions and some people are more interested in post-production than others you know and uh, mm. some people are more excited about the possibilities and some people have a greater knowledge um, than others in terms of directors you know um, mm -hmm. and so being able to kind of um, help help show them the different things that might be possible um, is um, is part of the job yeah so I would like to talk about Upgrade in 2018. It's one of my favourite sci-fi movies. So I just, uh, I'm actually interested in how how that first came about. Um, do Do you know the because you've worked with Lee Winnell, who's directed this and The Invisible Man. Did you know him before uh, Upgrade? Uh, were you friends before, or it, like, yeah, I'm just very interested to see how that first came about. Yeah, Lee uh, also from Melbourne as well, but um, we didn't, you know, really know each other that well. Um, from the time that he was there and uh, he had a lot of success with a movie called Saw that he did yeah. with his mate James, James Wan, and then uh, moved to LA and he'd been living here for quite a while. But I edited a feature called The Mule um, um, that, um, that Lee was a writer, producer, uh, and he was acting in it as well, um, along with a, uh, another good friend of ours called Angus Sampson. And, uh, so I got to meet Lee through that process and he was involved a little bit in the cutting room as the producer and uh, so we had met and worked together then and then when he got an opportunity to uh, start directing and he was coming back to Australia um, the producers had reached out to me to to have a talk and then we reconnected and um, and you know found that we had a shared sensibility and um, and yeah got the opportunity to work with him on Upgrade which was yeah, I'm glad you enjoyed it. It's like, yeah, it was oh. one of the best experiences that I've had as an editor to work on on that movie. It was a lot of fun, and um, and yeah, it's, it's it's an enjoyable ride to watch with an audience. Yeah. So, so for listeners who, who haven't seen Upgrade, it is it's, it's pretty violent. It's very different as a sci-fi film. I think the way that it's shot and the way that it's edited is the reason why I think I like it so much. I always like to see things that I've not seen before. Very, I like things that are original. And I thought the way that that was all put together was very, it was very different to the things that I'd seen before with, and I, I think the, the plot and the story, it's just, it's all, it's all blended and, and seamlessly fitted in. And I think it's, and the acting's great as well. And it's, it's a, it's a special film. So people, if you haven't seen it, please watch it. It is, it is fantastic. So, so um, how long did it uh, take you to edit Upgrade? Yeah, look, that was probably about a 14 to 16 week cutting period with, with the director. Um, uh, you know, that includes things like we do test screenings with audiences and things like that as well in that time. Um, it was a little bit interrupted because of, um, you know, we started in Sydney and, and then at, at some point, you know, Lee needed to come back to LA and, you know, we tried to work remotely for a little while, but we ended up doing finishing off the movie um, here in Los Angeles. And um, but uh, but look, the time is you know a lot of that sort of time you're still thinking about the movie anyway, even when there's little mm. breaks in in working on it. So mm. it, it always it always helps sometimes to have a little bit of distance yeah. and then come back to finishing it. So um, just personally, how how did you find it difficult to edit Upgrade? Just because it seemed on a technical standpoint. A very difficult film to put together. Did you find it? Was it was it certainly a challenge to do? 
look, I think every film has its challenges, you know, so, and, and they're different depending on what they are. And, um, but look, it was, it was a great experience working with Lee and certainly there was a lot of great performances. So that helps, you know, mm. uh, the challenge becomes when you've got really great performances across the board um, from all the actors uh, and especially Logan Marshall Green in the Lee mm. role. Uh, the challenge then is actually um, not just trying to find the one part of the performance or the one take that works, but kind of having to choose between all of the really great material that you have. Uh, and so uh, the challenge, you know, becomes in films like that where you've got to try and be judging it as, uh, and as I said, sort of trying to be critical of it and sort of um, holding it up to the light to say, is this particular part uh, as good? You know, does it belong in the movie? Is it is it really kind of going to hold the audience's attention in the best possible way. And so choosing kind of the difference between something that's great and really great was kind of the challenge. But the, the other part of it, of course, is that for a large part of the movie, you've got just, um, you've got one actor on screen by themselves, you know, talking, mm -hmm. um, you know, to, you know, a, a, a disembodied voice. So that um, that's challenging as well, just in terms of how to put that together in a seamless way. And, mm. uh, and again, just to keep the audience feeling engaged. But the main thing I think with most movies is to try and find that emotional connection for the audience. And mm -hmm. that's when, whether it's a, a, whether it's a comedy or a straight drama or a, a horror film, um, finding that emotional connection between the audience and the characters in the movie is what is going to make it successful. Yeah. And uh, so it's helped by having really great script and really great yeah. actors that are well directed. Um, but that's part of our job is that we're spending a lot of time doing that. And mm. I think also for a movie like that, there's a lot of time spent on sound and music. And that's something that um, uh, Lee is really passionate about um, sound, especially in his movies. And mm. um, so even before the sound team gets involved um, in editorial, we're spending a lot of time working on uh, mm. early temp versions of that and, and sometimes trying out um, possible temp score and figuring out where the placement of those things are going to be, but mm. also working the sound design uh, ideas just to make sure that you're leaving room for them for when the, uh, for when the, um, when the actual sound team comes in and they get to sort mm. of get their hands on it, but that they've, kind of got not only a little bit of a roadmap for the things that the director is liking, but also that there's space within the picture cutting uh, for them to put those sounds in there. So yeah, a lot of the challenge was kind of working that stuff in there and then, but it, it also gave us the flexibility. We could, um, we could even change some of the dialogue as well, because sometimes that dialogue's happening you know, not, not on screen, you're not seeing the yeah. other person talking. So we could actually manipulate some of those things and then uh, change reactions and stuff because of that. So that was part of the fun of it. But yeah, certainly yeah. Um, the challenge was, was in trying to keep it engaged, engaging for the audience and yeah. wondering whether that was going to work. But as soon as we saw it with an audience, of course, um, we knew straight away that it was working pretty well. And yeah. um, then it becomes just, just tweaking and refining. Yeah, it, 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 has, it, it definitely worked. It's, it's a, it's in my eyes, a, a very special film. And I think it's, it's great. I guess, I guess what I thought was the most special thing about it is, do you know the, the action scene, especially the first one when Stem's in the back of his knees uh, and that bit where he like flips up with the camera and things like that. I mean, like how, like how, I'm not good with the technicalities of it. So um, like, I mean, that must've been so fun to edit and put together. But like, as I said, like, if you could just speak about, especially that, that action scene, like what it was like to edit and the technicality of it, if you can, please. Yeah, look, that was something that, um, those ideas that, um, of, of the way that that was shot uh, mm. came from the collaboration between Lee, the director, and Stefan Duccio, the cinematographer. And um, Stefan had played around with similar kind of effects, I think in commercials and or maybe music videos that he had worked on, um, but then taking it to this level and introducing it into a, an action fight scene. And basically the, um, the, the camera uh, moves are tracked to the actors' uh, bodies and so that the camera moves um, as they are moving. And, um, so there was a little bit of testing of that idea um, that we did in pre-production and um, looking at um, how that was going to work, but it still was difficult to know, like it was a cool looking idea, but it was difficult to know how when that whole scene was together, 
whether that was going to work or just be really disorientating for the audience or confusing. And uh, so I think everyone was a little bit unsure at first, but once, um, once we had all the raw materials and we cut together a version of that scene and everyone could see how well it was working, then it gave everyone confidence to, you know, I was able to kind of watch that with the cinematographer and, and, uh, and director um, on set during while they were filming. And then so it gave them confidence when they got to other scenes to keep going mm. with that because it was working really well. We did some little enhancements in post-production for some of that stuff um, and added little bits more of that as a post effect. Um, yeah. But for the most part, you know, Lee is very keen to do as much of that stuff in camera as possible. He loves practical effects. He loves the idea of, um, you know, achieving as much as he possibly can in camera, um, mm -hmm. rather than kind of leaving it to a sort of tricky post-production thing. And mm -hmm. so it's sort of, it's a riskier approach in a way because, mm -hmm. you know, you kind of, uh, you've got to get it right, you know, on the day and you've got to have trust in your vision and, um, so, but I, I think it's a much more successful one. It's, it's fun. And it also means it's exciting for me as an editor, because as I'm putting it together, it's kind of already there and working and you can, you can totally see what you've got rather than having to imagine it and then hope that it's going to work as mm -hmm. a visual effect later. Um, mm -hmm. You can definitely kind of really make sure that it's, it's working right from the first moment. So yeah, yeah that was a, that was definitely, it's a unique a unique kind of fight sequence and um but yeah. it also it's an, an idea that works for the storytelling as well which yeah. is really important because mm -hmm. it kind of actually shows um what's happening there's a difference visually when um when yeah. the stem kind of character is in control you know so then yeah. it kind of is a it's another visual cue for the audience and so again it's it's not just sort of a gimmicky effect for the sake of it it's kind of woven mm -hmm. into the storytelling idea which is really important you touched on you touched on a point there, which I'd like to go into on the Invisible Man about how it's uh, what there's no point in having a like as you said a gimmicky effect if it's if it's if it means nothing if you get what I mean almost and uh, definitely we'll touch on that with the Invisible Man but yeah oh, oh, for people who haven't seen Upgrade please check that one out because it is it's, it's a really awesome film and it's it's fantastically put together you can just see how everyone's working in a tandem everyone saw the vision and everyone and you can see it in the end goal and this the the endings uh it's, it's a good one it's a it, it'll it, i i think i i watched it with my dad originally and we we definitely have mixed feelings about it and um some will like it and some won't and it's uh i think that's good though because it's a filming everything about it's all about opinion and once you if you're evoking emotion from people regardless of bad or good I, I think that's important in film so uh, yeah, yeah check, check check out Upgrade. So, <clears throat> so the idea of the Invisible Man's been talked about for quite a while in cinema, I think. So I was obviously I was very excited to hear about it when Lee was when I heard Lee was going to direct it. So I'm just interested to see where where you were at when Lee came to you with the idea of doing the Invisible Man. Yeah, absolutely. So Upgrade had come out and and you know had achieved you know some really great success and got a great um, response from audiences and and critics and. Uh, so everyone was excited to hear about what Lee was doing next and um, of course you know I was just keen to to work on uh, whatever he would do next because I knew you know he had lots of options um, and then yeah this idea came from something that he pitched to the people at Universal who um, they own that intellectual property of of these kind of the, the these these monsters that they have kind of made movies from a long time ago and um, based on a based on a novel um the invisible man and so but lee had an idea for them that was a much you know a fresher take it was just something that was kind of a, a unique way of approaching the storytelling and um and everyone was like you know really excited about that and so um he was telling me about that from early days but then you know uh, and i knew then that he was writing the script and partly um the tricky thing is um, if you're working on other projects to make sure you're available, you know, cause sometimes it can, you know, it could be on a, a movie from anywhere from a, a few months to a year. And so um, it's, um, it's always a little bit of a juggle, you know, there's directors that I love to work with and Lee's one of those people that I'd just be so happy to work with anytime. Uh, cause we have a lot of fun as much as anything else. And so um it worked out that i was available when they were going to start shooting and mm -hmm. we got to get a lot of the same crew back together and um and uh but yeah that was one that i was probably more involved with you know throughout the development of the script and mm. and in pre-production than uh, mm. than even on upgrade 
Very cool. And it, there's, a, there's, a, there's definitely an element of a risk creating a film like The Invisible Man. So obviously Lee's got some some like real courage to take a film as yourself because there's definitely a challenge to come with a film where there is going to be an invisible person in there and it's how it's going to take on screen. So were you guys at all worried about that? Or did you have all confidence in your guys' ability as a team to create what, what is developed on screen and create what success The Invisible Man has had? Look, I, I think um, I certainly I, I've got yeah, definitely confidence in the team and, and certainly a lot of confidence in, in Lee's ability as a filmmaker. Uh, mm. Look, reading the, reading the screenplay was certainly, you know, it, it was an amazing read and certainly, um, you know, had all of the elements that you would expect and want and hope to have um, that are there in the final film in terms of mm. the tension and the, the scares and the excitement. Um, but the actual execution especially um, wanting to do a lot of this stuff practically um, and also how minimal some of the execution was like some, some of the, some of the material is just shots of empty rooms, you know, and, um, and a lot of it was always going to come down to the performance of uh, the lead character and um, to, you know, which ended up Elizabeth Moss playing uh, the lead role. And so much of the film's success relies on her delivering a, a really amazing performance. Yeah. And I think the concern was and the risk was that some of these things could end up looking a bit silly. You know, it's a fine line between something that was going to be yeah. really terrifying and then mm -hmm. something that was almost going to make you laugh because of yeah. as soon as you've got objects floating in the air and things like that, um, mm -hmm. if you're not kind of totally engaged and believing the world of the movie, that stuff can kind of, you know, it can get silly pretty quickly. And so it was yeah. always just trying to find that balance and also then try and to know how long to you could eke out the tension of the idea that maybe there's someone in the room or not uh how long you can kind of stretch that that amount of tension for the audience mm -hmm. um without it being boring or feeling like mm -hmm. there's nothing there's not enough going on so mm -hmm. those were some of the challenges but yeah look I've, I've always got um confidence in in lee because he has such consideration for his audience and he is constantly thinking um, and making decisions as a filmmaker with his audience in mind. And mm -hmm. um, the same with the producers at Blumhouse are very much concerned with that as well. And mm -hmm. I think that's a discipline that is really important to have, um, mm -hmm. especially with a movie like that, because you've got to, um, it's not just sort of about doing things that you would like to do as a filmmaker or that excite you, but actually kind of remembering that you're making this for an audience and what's going to be most satisfying for them. And so that's mm. something that we're constantly trying to recalibrate for ourselves while we're yeah. making the movie. Yeah. And as, as you touched on about how it is important to not make it gimmicky and we've all got to believe this world. I think, I think one of the things that I found that helped that almost with the film was ha having a realistic way for someone to become invisible. So I liked how it was brought into the story in, in a realistic way, if you get what I mean. So I thought that was very clever on, on Lee's part to do that and, and allow us to believe, as you said, believe in, in what we, like there is somebody invisible in this room at certain times and, and, and whatnot. So I thought that was a bit, very, very clever. So I guess my question to you is, as you said, so what was the, I don't want to say, is vibe the right word? What was the, the, the theme kind of with your editing that you wanted for The Invisible Man? Was it, was it constant tension? Was it, because it wasn't, it's not jump, it's not always jump scares. It's a bit of like emotional, if you get what I mean. It's like, is somebody actually there type thing? So just from your perspective, what was the vibe you wanted to take within the editing? Well, I think, um, I think, the, the main thing, you know, for Lee is he, he kind of wanted it to be an uncomfortable experience for the audience, really, you know, and um, uh, with, however that might be, and maybe sometimes it might be a jump scare, but it'd have to be a very, you know, well-crafted one because, mm -hmm. you know, that's something that he cares about as well. And it, not just for the sake of having it, but to kind of actually use it as a way of building tension. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think overall, the, the way that I've found that you achieve that is is sort of having a character that you actually genuinely care about. So some, some way of for the audience to connect um, mm -hmm. to your characters, then they're going to feel more for them. You know, they're going to have that more of a sense of peril. Uh, they're going to want mm -hmm. that character to survive and be okay. And they're going to emotionally invest in that character. Then mm -hmm. in a way, 
making sure that you've got that stuff working makes the makes the tension and the terror easier to achieve. Mm. Um, and of course, having an amazing actress like Elizabeth Moss in that role goes a long way to to yeah. helping with that as well. You know, yeah. when you've got a character that is sympathetic, uh, but it's certainly it's in there in the writing, and there's lots of little bits and pieces that that are there for us to feel like we're connecting to her mm -hmm. and we're on her side, uh, and therefore we kind of go on that journey with her and sort of want mm -hmm. her to to survive. And you know, I think that's true of, of most most movies. It's sort of our main thing is to kind of get the audience to care about these characters first yeah. and then then the rest of the things are, are easier yeah that's what i was going to say how much e I mean, it's never an easy job but how much easier for you is it when you have an actress like elizabeth moss who obviously is amazing in that film does it make your job easier to do when someone has a performance like that because i think Oh, obviously, the, the Invisible Man came out, I think it was early 2020. So obviously, COVID happened and things like that. So I think, personally, she might have got, I mean, she, I think she's got, she's got, obviously got a lot of critical acclaim for it anyway. But I think she might have got a lot more if it hadn't come out when it did. And then obviously, the world collapsed type of thing. Because she is, as you said, how difficult it must have been. to. She's just acting on her own a lot of the time, a bit like Logan Marshall Green as well. But the, she, she's a, she is special. So to back to my original question, how it, does it make it easier when someone has a performance like that for you? Yeah, look, uh, look, some things are easier because um, often, you know, a, a, an actor of her caliber will be able to achieve something without any dialogue. You know, sometimes we can say, well, look, there's that dialogue there. We don't even really need her to say that because you can just see it on her face. You know, something that is there at the script stage, because when you're reading the script, you've got to be able to understand that and understand what the character's motivation is. But when you've got someone who's uh, such an outstanding actor, you can just watch and feel the things that they're trying to convey. Um, and, uh, and so that, that sort of helps. And sometimes it kind of means we have to say, well, look, let's, this now seems redundant for her to say something like that for that character, because you can clearly see that's what's happening. Um, and also helps to keep the audience engaged because you're just so captivated by watching her performance and you can kind of, She's constantly changing and calibrating her performance to slightly different degrees. So she's not repeating the same things over and over. And so that, that is also helpful. She's also an actor who's very um, clear each time and, and constantly that was something she was um, able to achieve with Lee's direction to know exactly where she was in the story at any time. So, you know, each scene was always like a slightly different, um, a slightly different kind of flavor of fear or terror mm -hmm. or um, concern. And so that was certainly something that helps. But the difficulty, as I was saying before as well, working with an actor of that caliber is there, there's not really any bad performances. It's, it's yeah. hard to throw things away. It's hard to kind of, yeah. um, to keep remembering that you want to keep the step back and make sure the overall story is still engaging because at any one moment, like some of those scenes could be, you know, twice or some, some of the original versions were maybe four times as long, uh, mm. some of the scenes that are in the movie. And we ended up kind of cutting it down to kind of be considerate of the overall pacing of the film. Mm -hmm. But each scene in and of itself wasn't a bad scene. You know, no. they're all great actors. You're watching a really compelling performance. So mm -hmm. it's fine to sort of watch it in and of itself. And then the challenge is to say, okay, uh, some of this stuff is great but we're going to have to take it out, you know, and yeah. uh, that's, that's the challenge of working um, with such great performances. Mm -hmm. I think that's what's, that is what's great about the invisible man. Cause as you said, you, you have these long takes where there's nobody in the scene. There's a, there's not just a physical terror. There, there's a psychological terror there because he, it, the guy's not there and you can't see him, but it's the play on the mind. And then there's, I mean, some of the, some of the scenes in the invisible man are so shocking. Like you just do not expect, like, do not expect them to happen. Cause that's why I love the pacing of that film. Cause I felt in the first say half an hour, f f 35 minutes, you, you get, it's a similar pace. It's a slow burn, but there's terror in there. And then there's, I, I, I don't want to, I don't want to spoil it for people who haven't seen it, but there's a scene, I think where it kicked on for me was the scene in the, the, uh, the when they're at the restaurant. And uh, that is when it, that's when it, the film just like takes off onto a new like stratosphere almost. And that's, was that obviously that's something you guys spoke about? Is that something you wanted to do? Really shock people with certain certain scenes? Yeah, absolutely. It was definitely there in the writing, and and in a way, 
um, having that sort of set up in the certain pacing of the of the opening of the film um, is very tension filled. But then there is this period where um, things are only starting to happen gradually, you know, mm-hmm. and it's just kind of slowly ratcheting up the tension. And um, and there would be ways, obviously, of moving through those scenes quicker mm-hmm. and not spending as much time. But I think it comes back to that our sense of spending time with the characters, feeling like time is passing feeling like you're connecting with them, getting to know them. And there's, there's really important reasons for all of those little story beats that are in there. And there's also something about the pacing of it that kind of lulls you into a sense that you think you know what's happening. Um, and then, yes, at some point, and it's, it is pretty much around that point that you're talking, um, yeah. you know, the film kind of, you know, takes off in another trajectory and then it's kind of just moves quicker and quicker yeah. um, and more and more things are happening. And, um, and I think that's part of, um, what's surprising and exciting about it for the audience that just when yeah. they think, well, this is the biggest and worst thing that's going to happen, there's another thing coming. And, and then at that point, you just sort of, we wanted to keep things moving, you know, and keep mm-hmm. the audience off balance in the same way that the character is in, in, the, in the story. Definitely. That's the, it is the per, it, for me, it was almost, it was my favourite horror film of 2020 by, by far. It's my favourite genre of horror. But because it was... Cause, and there's many different variations of horror, but it just had the perfect blend of, as I said, psychological and physical terror almost at, in the same, at, the same, at the same time. So I do commend you guys on that because it, it was, it's, it's a special, special film. Oh, um, thanks, man. It was fun, fun to work on for sure. And, yeah, it's, you know, I'm definitely, definitely proud of my, my work on it. But, you know, everyone, it, I think, did a great job. I don't know if you know anything, but I read something. Is there, is there talks of a sequel for uh, this film? Look, I, I know when a film <laughs> is that successful, there's always going to be talk of a, of a sequel, you know? So um, it did really well and, and it was, you know, audiences liked it. It was critically well. And, and luckily enough, you know, it was on at the box office where people actually got to see it in, yeah. in cinemas, yeah. at least for a little while before, uh, before the pandemic hit. So, um, so yeah, look, I, I don't know 100% you know, whether that would ever happen. But like I said, when something's mm-hmm. that successful, it, people are always going to be, uh, yeah. you know, asking and talking about it and trying mm-hmm. to make it happen. So um, I think it'd be great if it did. And, you know, I think it'd, it'd really just come down to whether Lee has a has an idea for yeah. um, for the sequel mm-hmm. that he can get excited about to make, you know. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, um, yeah. Well, I you know, I... he's not, not going to do it unless it's something that he can mm-hmm. be passionate about as a mm-hmm. filmmaker. Well, I obviously I loved I loved it so I'd love to see it. I think he left it. I think the ending is very good. I think the I think the ending was really special actually, and I think he left it open for for that, which I think is fantastic and, and great to do. So it's been doing it's been doing the award season a bit, hasn't it? The Invisible Man. It's been talked about and certainly you actually won an award yourself for it in the is it the Australian Academy of Cinema Award? You you won for editing. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. I've been uh, fortunate enough to be nominated and um, and and won a number of awards for for my work on that, which has been really great. And it's also won awards for, um, you know, Elizabeth's acting and Lee's directing, yeah. and uh, been nominated for everything from visual effects to production design and mm-hmm. uh, cinematography and sound design. All of these people who worked on it did such amazing amazing work, and um, and so it's nice that it's getting recognised. I mean, it's been an unusual year and. For a lot of people, mm. it was the last movie they got to experience yeah, yeah. Um, in a cinema, you know, and yeah. uh, here we are nearly a year on and uh, we didn't think, you know, at the premiere or, you know, the opening mm-hmm. weekend that that would have been the case. Um, mm-hmm. But in a way, I think that's kind of, um, it kind of holds a certain place in people's mind even a year later because mm-hmm. it's, mm-hmm. you know, there's something about seeing uh, a movie like that, but especially that movie, seeing it with an audience is, you know, mm-hmm. it's part of the fun and the experience of watching a movie like that. It, it definitely, even though I guess a lot of people who, you know, we all had to get used to watching things at home uh, mm-hmm. on our couch, but um, there's something about being able to watch a movie like that with an audience that made it a pleasurable, a pleasurable experience. And um, uh, even if it was an uncomfortable one, as Lee yeah. uh, was hoping for, mm-hmm. uh, that it actually is still kind of stays with people and is still in people's mind. and. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm I'm proud to have been a part of it for sure. Do you uh, would you consider it your? I I don't know if you consider you you like you you grade your work. Is it your finest piece of work? Do you think The Invisible Man? Look, it's um, I, I guess the thing with it is that it's um, it's been a really great mix of uh, something that that um, a lot of critics liked. Um, yeah, audiences liked it. Did really well at the box office. Um, 
it was um, it was fun to work on. Um, so like you know, getting that mix is is really great. You know, because sometimes mm -hmm. you know I feel like I've done really great work on movies that not many people get to see for one reason or another. Yeah. Um, or you know maybe it's something that critics really like, um, but doesn't ever get to sort of do much of an audience or doesn't get an opportunity to screen at cinemas long yeah. enough to do really well at the box office. Mm -hmm. So there's something special when you get all of those things kind of coming together and um, mm -hmm. that sort of uh, gets critically acclaimed, audiences like it, and it actually, you know, makes money back for the people who uh, who pay for these things, you know. Mm -hmm. So um, so that's, that's exciting, you know, and mm -hmm. certainly I think every movie I do, I learn something and I think I'm constantly getting better at what I do. Uh, mm -hmm. so, you know, that's kind of the, the last movie that I, that I finished and I, you know, has been out there in the world. And so, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. I definitely think it's some of my, some of my best work and I'm, I'm really proud of it. And I, I completely agree. It's, it's, it's fantastic work from you, uh, Andy. So, uh, yeah, as I said, uh, I think it's a fantastic film and I would find it interesting because obviously, obviously I like to talk about awards because it's awards season almost right now. And it's obviously coming up to the big ones. And do you think... Do you, do you, I mean, I don't know. It's obviously had its advantages coming out because it was kind of like the last film everybody saw before COVID happened. Do you think it might have got a push for, say, Oscar nominations, things like that, if it came out a little later? Obviously, they're not out yet, but a bit more of a push. Do you think that would that could have been the case if it came out a little later? Yeah, look, honestly, I'm not sure. You know, like, yeah. I guess it's one of those things that it's, um, we'll, we'll never know. And, and, um, and, and I don't think, you know, no one, really ever sets out to kind of like win awards when they're when they're we're just trying to do the best work yeah. that we can and i'm sure it's the same for for elizabeth it's always nice to be recognized for those things but yeah. i think that there's there's like a whole lot of different factors that go into whether movies yeah. get nominated or win awards and so it's hard to know you know exactly what the right circumstances are and it's been a pretty unusual year on top of that yeah. as well so um so yeah i, I don't know but i do think you know, it would be great. Um, the more, you know, recognition that Elizabeth could get for that performance and that that movie gets, um, you know, as a, it's great because it just means more people will get to see it, you yeah. know, and uh, yeah. that's, that's, that's a really great thing. You know, it's what we want uh, ultimately is for it to have the widest audience possible. So uh, any recognition like that at this point helps. So. It's very good words, mate. And I totally, I, I, I personally think it's one, it was one of the best films of, of 2020 and, it was, I, I, I'll be honest when I say I didn't, I was sceptical going into it. I was really excited by Upgrade and things like that. So, but it was pulled off magnificently well on, on, on all levels, I think. So. Oh, thank you. Yeah. As I said, it was, yeah. And look, it was a lot of fun working on it. You know, that's the other, that's the other great thing, you know, about, uh, that I enjoy working with Lee, you know, we, we managed to have a good time along the way. Hmm. So um, coming to the end of, of our chat now, what I like to do with uh, some of the, the when I have people on is like, is is there currently any work, any movie, is, is there stuff that you're working on now? That I mean, obviously you can't obviously always talk about the things that you're working on. So I just I just like to ask if there's uh, stuff that you're working on or. Yeah, look, I'm working on a couple of different things at the moment. Um, but yeah, at the moment, uh, you know, I can't say too much about them, but um, yeah. uh, working on um, just finishing up a feature with some with a, a different director and some other producers, that'll be exciting. It's just hard to know at the moment when these things are going to get released yeah. because, you know, obviously, you know, it's the people that I'm working with would love these movies to come out in a cinema so that they can be enjoyed with an audience as a communal experience and I think mm -hmm. you know there's a sense of like wanting to wait and hopefully things improve in the world that people can get back into movie theatres mm -hmm. you know as a regular thing and um and so yeah at the moment everything's kind of on hold and you know yeah. got to keep those things a little bit a little bit on the down low until they figure out exactly when they're going to release I, and how. I, I can imagine and I can totally I can, can totally understand that's what it, movies are made for the cinema, aren't they? So at the end of the day, why would a director and an editor and a cinematographer, at the end of the day, they, all these films will end up being on television, but when they're first released, they're meant to be seen on the big screen. So I don't think there should, there should be any... The, the, people should get any hate for wanting to hold it back till we are have some normality so people can see, see it in the cinema. Yeah, exactly. You know, look, it's just... It's part of life that we all watch a lot of stuff, you know, streaming or at home and things now as well. But... Um, I think hopefully there's, there's an appetite still for people that will always be there wanting that communal experience. And certainly mm -hmm. there are certain kinds of films and, and, you know, 
horror or thriller type films are one of those ones that they're great fun, you know, to, to enjoy as a communal experience. Um, comedies is another one, you know, where you can kind of go and, and sort of laugh, you know, as a group of people and uh, it's still something really magical and, and great about that, you know, so I hope that that always exists. And so, yeah, I'm really supportive of that, but um, yeah, maybe when those things are coming out, we can have another chat and uh, we can talk more about <laughs> the next, please, the next things. Pl please, please do. I, I always say when, when I'm finishing these chats, if, if people will, will chat to me again, because obviously I'm just starting out and I hope to make this my career. I hope to make this I'm speaking to people like yourself all the time. And I, I, I'm very grateful for the fact that you take your time to, to come and speak to me today. So I really appreciate it, Andy. And please check out his films, check out Upgrade and check out uh, Invisible and check out his other films as well. But them two in particular, were, they're really special movies and Andy's a real talent in the Hollywood industry. You're going to see him for a while. Thanks, Joe. Great to chat, mate. No worries. Thank you very much. Please follow me on Instagram, underscore the Cinemascope. Check out Andy's films. Uh, I'm Joe Brown, the Cinemascope, and I will be doing this again. Thank you very much.